Good evening and welcome esteemed guests, fellow educators, sentient minds everywhere. I'm Patience Jackson Rose, a former special education teacher, administrator, author, and above all, a dedicated lifelong student of human potential. I want to just share with you tonight, even though most of you know me as CEO of Red Worldwide, and you're here at Red's uh, beautiful Metaversity, um, and we're so excited that you are here. We are an educational support services company, and we are so excited about making sure that educational services are available to everyone. Primarily, our audience has been businesses and individuals who are inventors, creators, um, those who have service businesses who want to bring them to market, but we also have schools. And so some of you didn't know that, and I know that uh, many of you have attended B-School you know, those of you who are business owners and are aspiring business owners, you come into our B-School Central and get an opportunity to participate in our courses. I am an instructional designer. I have a Master of Science degree in instructional design. So I have spent a lot of time making sure the courses are always available. But we do have live in um, uh, the metaverse uh, programs that we're going to be pushing forward, as well as we have online programs offsite that allow you to take advantage of many educational opportunities. So even though we're in a red talk tonight, I just want to take a chance to let you know that those things are available. However, right now we are celebrating this month, um, Disabilities Pride Month. And so for that reason, I wanted to have an opportunity to share um, with you as I've been invited by um, the awesome uh, team that is uh, just making this possible to be able to share with you all some really important things. And one of those things is how we are able to take the journey through making sure that people everywhere are celebrating this month with us, Disabilities Pride Month. Now, with that being said, um, we are going to uh, take a journey on um, of a different uh, turn tonight, and we're going to talk a little bit about diversity in education, but more importantly, neurodiversity. Um, it's very important to us that we are able to celebrate sentient minds, and we only understand what that is in a few minutes. Um, we want to get rid of any type of conspiracies that um, <laughs> are running around with regards to, you know, um, this whole concept of a person not being able to properly share who they are and what they are and the, from the mental standpoint and their emotional and educational standpoint. And so uh, because of that, we have chosen this as our topic. Um, and it is literally um, seeing things through the lens of cultivating human potential and making sure that we re- place any type of paradigms that are faulty with surrounding ADHD and the minds of people who have been diagnosed with ADHD. So with that being said, we're going to dispel some shadows right now. And I want to understand if everyone in the room and you you know you can raise your hand or you, if you're online and you in a chat uh, with us, you can actually, you know, just put your your hand up so that we can see you there, or you can put something in the chat to let us know that you do understand this. That ADHD is literally a diagnosis that or of of a disorder. And if any of you have ever known anyone that has been diagnosed with ADHD, or you yourself has been diagnosed with ADHD, this information I'm going to share with you tonight is probably going to be very different than what you've ever heard before. Matter of fact, it, not only is it going to be probably very different, it's going to debunk a myth that has been perpetuated and has stigmatized people who have this diagnosis for uh, for a long time. And so I want you to kind of rise along with me in this vehicle <laughs> because we're going to you know explain you know why it's very important for us to talk about it and we're going to actually take you to it so let's go with just starting from the very beginning um where we are and why we're here and um and then we'll jump
jump into replacing some narratives. Tonight's topic is destroying the ADHD conspiracy and cultivating the sentient minds of those who think and learn differently. Uh, I have a quote from one of my newest books um, that is actually about this exact topic. And it literally says, there are no deficits, just differences, waiting to be harnessed for their potential. And I really do believe that. I believe that there are really no deficits. Even though the deficit is in the name, I want you to be welcomed to a new perspective. We're going to see this thing very differently after tonight, because once you really understand what is happening in the mind of a person who has received that diagnosis, I believe you will also come to understand that really um, we've seen it very differently than we should have, and we've stigmatized it when we shouldn't have. So the prevalent view of ADHD, a disorder characterized by constant distractions, impulsivity, um, hyperactivity is deeply ingrained in our society. A society that often labels and dismisses these traits as undesirable, um, troublesome, even deviant. But what if we've all been viewing this very wrong? What if the narrative we've been told for decades is not only flawed, but immensely damaging. Consider this, the National Institute of Mental Health estimates that 8.4% of children and 2.5% of adults in the US have ADHD. The ADHD statistics in 2023 that were just published by Forbes Health um, state that approximately 8.7 million adults in the US have ADHD approximately 2.6%, no matter who is counting, over 6 million people, almost twice as many men as women, have received often devastating, debilitating news that they have ADHD. And while each one of these people are unique and brilliant and capable of incredible things, they many times have no clue. Our society spends approximately $42.5 billion annually on diagnosing and treating, treating these individuals, with more recent numbers coming in at about $122 billion, including the effects of the excess unemployment and loss of productivity on what is, in essence, an alternate form of sentience, what I call the sentient mind. Well, what is a sentient mind? one that has a heightened sensitivity and intelligence. I see it as the capacity to recognize, perceive, and interact with stimuli in an atmosphere and environment where you are that most people ignore. This type of intelligence must be cultivated, nurtured, celebrated, and welcome to the table in all sectors of our community. The ADHD diagnosis criteria outlined by the American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, also called DSM, and I think it's DSM-5 now, focuses almost exclusively on what individuals with ADHD can't do compared to their neurotypical peers. What's missing in an exploration of their strengths, their resilience, and their unique ways of thinking and learning? is the fact that we ignore it. We've been placing ADHD in a box, a box built by societal expectations and educational rigidity and medical generalizations. It's time for us to break the box. The weight of labels is heavy and the impact of stigmatization is vast. It can suffocate potential, curb curiosity, and mask the brilliance that lies within. Let's challenge the notion that those with ADHD need to be fixed or that they are a problem that needs to be solved. What if we, as educators, as parents, as policymakers, focus less on managing the symptoms of ADHD and more on nurturing the sentient minds of these that these symptoms sometimes mask? What if we recognized ADHD not as a disorder, but as a unique and vibrant way of interacting with the world? It's a replacement of perspectives, I know, I know, 
that opens a new realm of possibilities, though. We can begin to see the sentient mind for what it truly is, a reservoir of untapped potential, brimming with creativity, innovation, and a unique way of perceiving the world. This is not a baseless claim. A study by White and Shaw showed higher levels of creativity, resilience, and cognitive flexibility in individuals who had that ADHD diagnosis. These are not flaws. These are strengths. I invite you to join me on this journey of exploration and understanding as we turn the conventional narrative on its head and celebrate the sentient mind in all its unique, vibrant, and often misunderstood glory. As we move forward, let's remember that every mind has its own language, and it's all about us having the time to learn to speak it. Decoding brilliance, the ADHD as a sentient mind. I'd like to share this tale, a little story of a student who had been deemed troublesome, unfocused, and difficult. I know many of you who are in education and who are watching this, you're probably very much familiar with the um, IEP process or the 504 plan, the plan that gets put together when your students or your children are in um, school that you know is a traditional school they plan uh, for a individualized education for your child and in this they write down the goals and objectives that need to be met so that you know that the child is making progress and that they're really um, meeting the need of the child and so many times i have um, questioned this process i mean you know because i my my tenure with education goes way back. I have been an educator for a very long time. Started educating when I was in the eighth grade. I started teaching preschool in the eighth grade. This is before that we had um, these uh, regulations that said how old a preschool teacher should be. So at that time, at 14, uh, actually at 13, going on to being 14, I was allowed to, after certain hours, leave the the middle school where I was attending and go over a few blocks to a preschool and teach. And I taught there in the afternoon for about three or four hours. And I have, as a, just a general rule, I have always tried to continue to make myself a lifelong learner so I'd have more to give to my students. I do it now even with my clients in business. I try to make sure that I'm always, you know, keeping up with the standards, keeping up with whatever the newest and most innovative best practice is. But what has happened is that we are so focused sometimes on what we are seeing in the behavior of the child that we don't necessarily always pay attention to the things that are going on in and around that behavior. And so um, these 504 plans and education plans that we used to do, IEPs, IPPs, those plans helped us to write down information that would give us the ability to see the whole child and to see what was going on in and around the the situation so that we could be uh, be better at trying to meet the need or teaching the child or causing the child to learn. Well, in this little uh, story that I want to tell you, I really want you to understand that a student that I'm speaking of right now, we'll call him Alex, um, was not necessarily the most model pupil in terms of adhering to established norms. He didn't meet the, um, the guidelines of uh, being able to be in a regular classroom. So, of course, he had had to be removed and put into what we call special education. This child was often distracted by the buzzing of the flies <laughs> outside the window, the rustling of the leaves, you know, maybe outside of the door. Um, sometimes he would be seen just sitting there daydreaming, and he was often looked at as an underachiever. His grades were poor. His social interactions were awkward. He didn't really get along with students well, and he was you know, seen as being a an issue or a problem frequently from one grade to the next. Now, this boy, Alex, he was not a failure, nor was he incapable. He was just different. He was disguised <laughs> in the situation because he found it hard to learn in the conventional way. He eventually was diagnosed with ADHD. 
okay? And the way that the school demanded that students uh, came into alignment with their rules, he had to be in the classroom, he had to be in the chair, and he had to be in the chair for a certain amount of time for him to get credit for being in the chair. Um, and But he had a thirst for knowledge, an insatiable curiosity, and a unique way of seeing the world. He was an explorer of thoughts and ideas, diving deep into subjects that fascinated him. He didn't pay too much attention to the things that he weren't, wasn't interested in, but I can guarantee you this, in watching him, he was so uh, tremendously uh, excited about things that really did interest him. His teachers, unfortunately, didn't see that had this potential. They saw a distracted child, a problem. They did not realize that they were in the presence of greatness. They were in the presence of a sentient mind. They had no clue who Alex really was. Let's journey to the realm of a cognitive science where the term sentience is uh, refers to the ability to experience sensations and emotions and thoughts. However, when we explore the term, when we're talking about a sentient mind, we're looking in the context of ADHD as a mind that perceives and thinks and learns different than other minds. A mind that is not just sentient, but vibrantly so. A mind that is full of potential, teeming with uh, opportunities and creativities and bursting with innovative ideas. It's these minds that often see what others miss, that can find patterns in chaos, that can innovate and create in ways that others may not even imagine. It's these minds that can, given the right environment and the right support, can become catalysts for change and progress. But how can we nurture these sentient minds? these potential catalysts of change. If we continue to stigmatize and suppress their inherent abilities, how can we unleash their potential if we focus solely on their struggles and not on their strengths? A review of the research conducted by White and Shaw highlights that these unique abilities inherent in those with ADHD, higher levels of originality and flexibility in thought, coupled with an ability to think outside of the proverbial box, all of which are key elements of creativity. If we can shift, our, and I would even say replace our perspectives and begin to see the sentient mind in a new light, we can begin to nurture its inherent strengths and abilities rather than suppress them. We can stop trying to fit these brilliant minds into a one size fits all kind of model of education and instead tailor an approach that serves their unique needs and optimizes their incredible potential. In essence, we need to not just talk about the goals and objectives that they need to meet, actually become a uh, part of the standardized education, but we need to go beyond that. We need to redefine our understanding of ADHD and see it not only as, a, um, as something that they're experiencing, but a lens through which they see the world. Not a disorder, but a different type of perception as an alternate cognitive style, teeming with unexplored potential. Our journey continues as we further explore this idea and delve into the opportunities and the, um, I would say, even the blessings that it presents. The billion dollar misdirection. I really want to question the special education paradigm tonight. And let me just say this. I went to school like most instructors. I went to graduate school to become a special educator. I mean, I even enrolled in a master of arts program in special education, not regular education. I knew that I wanted to be an educator of children who learned and thought differently from the very beginning. And so I started in my educational journey after doing music therapy and learning music. I went right into school and in graduate school because I wanted to work with children who learn differently. Having understood the concept of a sentient mind, I wanted to de delve deeper into a massive, deeply entrenched system that was a paradigm that I had no idea that I wasn't prepared to fight. <laughs> In the United States alone, the federal government spent an estimated $13.6 billion on special education in 2020. That's an astronomical figure. But here's the billion-dollar question. 
where does this money go? And to whom does it really serve? This funding predominantly supports a system that is di designed to identify, categorize, and treat. Hear what I said, identify, categorize, and treat these children. It is a system that often works on the assumption that children are broken and the need for fixing is so prevalent that more money needs to be spent per child to make sure that they become like the other children. Yet, is that truly the case? Is there something inherently wrong with the sentient minds or is the system itself flawed? Our friend, the daydreamer, remember Alex, has now turned to engineer as an adult. He is a case in point. He wasn't a problem that needed fixing. Instead, he was a mind that required understanding, support, and the freedom to explore and learn in his own unique way. Interestingly enough, when it comes to evaluating the effectiveness of the special education practices, the data points a sobering, or paints a sobering picture. Despite billions spent, the National Assessment of Education Progress, the NAEP report, it, it reports a persistent achievement gap between students with and without disabilities. Moreover, the emotional toll on these children often exacerbates their, dis their difficulties and their disabilities um, end up becoming more of a challenge. And it results in lower self-esteem and higher rates of depression and anxiety. And we have seen a true deal of students who have come out of special education who could not deal with life, period, and ultimately succumbed to suicide. This begs a deeper question. Are we misdirecting our resources and efforts in trying to fix something that isn't broken? Could we achieve more by realigning our approach, shifting our resources to creating an environment that supports, nurtures, and unleashes the potential of these sentient minds? Alex, remember him, who found school challenging, but grew up to be an engineer and inventor. To, he created solutions for complex problems. He has exemplified the untapped potential that lies dormant within our classrooms. With the right support and opportunities, these minds can be catalysts for change, innovation, and progress. And if we catch them early enough, many times they are catalysts early on. This potential can't be unlocked by viewing sentient minds as problematic or deficient. We need to recognize them for their diverse, creative, and innovative thinking prow prowess that they have. We need to reassess our approach to education and especially special education and look for ways to reallocate these billions to better support and develop sentient minds. So how do we bridge the gap? How do we embrace a type of neurodiversity? How do we get to the place where we are actually able to make sense of what we have been experiencing? Well, we know there is a gap in our education structure, a chasm that separates the learning environment we have created from the diverse learners it was meant to serve. Our current system, modeled on standardization, often overlooks the incredible neurodiversity among our students. This leads to a paradox where those who deviate from the norm, the sentient minds among us, grapple with a system not designed for them. Renowned Harvard professor, Dr. Todd Rose, in his seminal work, The End of Average, pos posits that a, an average student does not exist. His research shatters the misconception of a standard student mold that everyone should fit into. He implores for a fundamental shift in our perspective from standardization to personalization or customization in education, a plea that resonates deeply with the core message of this talk today. 
imagine an education system that doesn't impose a one size fits all model, but rather acknowledges and celebrates the unique learning styles of each student. A system that doesn't stifle creativity and uniqueness, but nurtures it. An environment that is not a battlefield for sentient minds, but a sanctuary where they can harness their unique strengths and unlock their potential. That's the promise of a personalized and customized education. This isn't a utopian idea. It's achievable, provided we commit to reassessing our approach and restructuring our systems. It starts with you and me. As educators and parents and mentors, as a society, we need to bridge the gap and create a learning environment that caters to all minds, not just the average. Sentient minds are not problems to be fixed. They are brilliant minds waiting to be understood and harnessed. And that is the paradigm replacement we need to implement. I invite you all to envision this bridge. Envision a system where ADHD is not stigmatized, but recognized as a different valid form of sentience. The task before us is not easy, but if we can dare to change our perspective, we can bridge this gap and cultivate our, an, an environment where every sentient mind can truly share. So how can we move to be able to decode brilliance. Well, I have some an acronym for decode, and I want us to utilize this acronym to actually uh, gain some new skills. So the first thing we need to do is we need to discover. Start by recognizing and acknowledging the existence of diverse cognitive abilities. Everyone is not the same. And even all of the special education students who have been dumped into special education classes are the are sent out to the uh, the the rooms where they go to get the help they're supposed to get. All of those students are not the same. They all have diverse cognitive abilities, and we need to recognize, acknowledge, and celebrate their diversity. Additionally, we need to empower. Equip sentient minds with tools and strategies that can help them harness their unique strengths. Sometimes they don't know that that type of thing is even accepted or appreciated in a classroom, that they can actually share their viewpoint, the way that they see the world that they can actually be in a situation where they can make sure that other people in their space know what it is that they're experiencing from their perspective. We then need to celebrate the achievements, big or small, of sentient minds reinforcing their self-confidence and their self-worth. They need to know that we see them. They need to know that we appreciate them, and they need to know that their achievement, whatever it was, it fits somewhere into the landscape of everything else that's being done in the classroom, everything else that's being done in the world. Oh, they need to um, have the ability to understand that we are watching them. We have to observe, take time to understand the unique learning styles and the needs that they may have. Their requirements are important. And sometimes the requirements that we put down on the 504 plan are not the full realm of the requirement. Some things extend beyond what it is that we put in the goals and objectives. We've got to take the time to observe and understand everything about their unique style. We need to develop, actively develop and foster an environment conducive to the growth. We've got to be able to position ourselves so that we are moving them beyond their environment so that they can see that what it is that they're able to do in the classroom is something that also can possibly be done ultimately in the world. Then we need to encourage and motivate sentient minds to continually push their boundaries and reach for their full potential. 
It's so important for us to be able to take the opportunity to decode brilliance, because when we do, we make things possible for the sentient mind that is not possible without this. We want to bridge the educational divide right now. How can we actually look at the customization and the personalization? Um, and what is it that we can really do understanding that these things do really exist? Well, I want us to really pay attention to a couple of things. And when we're looking at, you know, standardization, we've got to see that there are shortcomings. Yes, I understand that we have to have tests. We have to have a way to measure. And measurements are important. But so many times our measurements are skewed. They do not give us what it is that we were trying to get. <laughs> the information that we were trying to extract from the test sometimes does not come out because our students do not all fit into the testing landscape the way that they should. And so for that reason, when we recognize that standardization is not giving us the proper measurement, it is our responsibility to understand what we can do to personalize and customize, not just the learning environment, the materials that we're using, but also the way that we measure to see whether or not our students have learned the material. Then we've got to reimagine what things really should be. How can we implore others to help us along our journey? Because the one thing that I have said many, many times is that there seems to be no continuity from one grade to the next. And unfortunately, because teachers change, we have high turnover rates, sometimes students go to new schools, we end up in a situation where we fail to properly assist our students in making the changes that they need to make from one year to the next. And so for this reason, it's so important that we document, document, document as much as possible. And I'm not talking about writing incident reports and accident reports. I mean documenting the wins, documenting what worked, documenting how the student actually was able to share and infuse himself into the environment so that when the next teacher comes on board, they can pick that up and begin to use the same strategies for helping our sentient minds move in a way that is appropriate for them. As we talk more about our vision for the future, I want to ignite a flame of neurodiversity. I really believe it's important for us to understand the power in paying attention to the diverse learners that we have. We've journeyed through an alternate lens of ADHD. We've analyzed the status quo and traversed the educational landscape through the eyes of a sentient mind. We've unpacked the billion dollar industry that aims to normalize these individuals and highlighted the urgent need for us to decode this brilliance and unleash it and, you know, within them. But what is the end game? What is our end goal? The ultimate aim is to ignite the flame of neurodiversity. It's to honor this uniqueness of our students and embrace the non-traditional and create an environment and atmosphere where everyone can thrive. It's about appreciating the different does not mean less. In fact, it often means more, more creativity, more innovation, more resilience. As we stand on the brink of a revolution, the imperative is clear. We must evolve from a system of uniformity and compliance to a rich tapestry that celebrates neurodiversity. We must remember that every mind has its unique language of brilliance. So let's shift the narrative from disability to capability, from disorder to uniqueness, and from burden to potential.
Let's ensure that our education system does not just tolerate neurodiversity, but values and nurtures it because in the end, every sentient mind deserves the opportunity to shine in its full brilliance. In this journey towards a future that fully appreciates neurodiversity, every single one of us has a role to play. Whether you're an educator, a parent, a policymaker, or an individual with a sentient mind, I urge you to join this movement to become an advocate for change. Remember, the power to rewrite the narrative lies within us. Let's unlock the potential. Let's ignite the flame. Let's celebrate the sentient mind. It was a hindrance. They labeled it a disorder. But what if the so-called limitations were, in fact, a different kind of brilliance? What if the very traits considered to be obstacles were the keys to unlocking unseen potential? We journey into the sentient mind, a universe where creativity, innovation, resilience, and unbounded energy converge. This isn't just a book. It's a manifesto, a plea to replace non-performing paradigms with the celebration of unique cognitive abilities. From the laws of gravity to modern technology, from the beats of music to the strokes of art, sentient minds have shaped our world. Isn't it time we understood, appreciated, and harnessed this power? The ADHD Conspiracy, debunking myths and displaying the brilliance of the sentient mind. A revolution in understanding. A revelation of potential.